Well, a terrifying journey that rocked one man's reality. Brian Melvin gives a stark look at what hell is really like and why you don't want any of your loved ones to go there. If you're enjoying Table Talk, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and remember to click that notification bell to stay up to date on all of our latest posts. In a single moment, everything can change. The closing of one chapter, the beginning of something new, where miracles become reality, and we get a glimpse of what lies beyond, the place where heaven meets earth. Well, according to a poll by Barna, only 71% of Americans believe in hell, and of those, only 32% believe it's an actual place. And the trend is growing, particularly in the Western world. So, is hell a real place? Well, with the help of our special guest, we'll take a look at this very important question. First joining me on the table is my daughter in love, Susanna Lamb. Woo! I'm so excited to be here. I know, right? <laughs> we have so many questions. You know, we've had people who've died and gone to heaven. Yeah but we haven't had one that died and went to hell. Right. And so it is gonna be very interesting because a lot of people don't believe hell is a real place. That's right, you have to balance the story. Yeah. Two sides. Anna Kendall, are you going to heaven? Uh, you bet I am. Yes, me too, <laughs> me too. You bet. Especially after reading his book. That's right, there's no way. <laughs> That's right. How are you, Rachel? Listen, I don't want to chance it. Like, no. I mean, I just can't even believe that people couldn't believe that hell yeah. was a real place. Yeah. The Bible is very clear. It talks you can't about even it. believe people. But even if you didn't believe, like, why would you chance that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Don't take a chance. Especially yeah. when Jesus has paid the price yeah. and all you have to do is accept him. That's right. It's so easy. I mean, why would anybody not do that? Mm -hmm. Cindy Johnston? You yes. did it, didn't you? I did it. Yes, I did. <laughs> you look so pretty. I love your dress. Thank you. Dress. Back to you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you spent your whole life telling people about Jesus. I mean, being in ministry, and it, it's amazing. That still is the greatest miracle, I think, when someone a, a changed life, when Jesus comes in their heart. Absolutely. And changes their life. And the Word says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's right. And that is the only way. There is no other way. That's right. Cindy Murdoch, we love these stories. Oh and my. it's important, really, I think, that we talk about some of these because I really believe we're in a season of darkness and we need God's mm -hmm. light to shine on uh, the darkness and really show truth. There's so much deception going on right That's now. That's exactly what I was gonna say is that when we see the percentage of what people, of who do not believe there's a hell, yeah. that the deception is so huge mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. yeah. even within the church, yeah. if there's a hell. So this is a very important program. Well, it really is. Well, he had a remarkable experience that transformed his life and he's here to tell us more about that. Please welcome Brian Melvin. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. How are Welcome you? Back. Are you ready to take on all the ladies at the table? <laughs> sure. <laughs> He's like, I'm not so sure. All right. Well, so <laughs> what would it take to change the mind of a proud, atheistic agnostic? Well, the answer is a perspective shattering experience that rocked Brian to the core. And Brian, um, we're just going to talk around the table. Tell me, um, if you will, kind of growing up, when did you kind of turn as far as make a decision you were gonna serve God and you didn't wanna be any part of that? If I told you, you'd probably laugh, but it was actually, I used to watch the old Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons, so they had this guy, Simon, with the time machine. And so he went back in time and had interviewed these philosophers and, uh, and these Greek gods and stuff, and so I got curious, so I started reading philosophy books. Because okay. you, you yeah. did grow up in church. Yeah, I did grow up in a Southern Baptist home. My parents were Southern Baptists. So philosophy, you know, I've heard other stories of people diverting, which there's nothing wrong with reading other books, obviously, mm -hmm. but the Bible not being the staple and beginning mm -hmm. to try to, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, read the mind of men and right. kind of men that didn't serve God, or right. men that thought they knew more, more than, than God, God. Yeah. that's really dangerous, yeah. isn't it? It can be very dangerous, but a lot of it is opens you up to new ideas oh. that really get you away from God. 
Yeah. And it turns you against confusion. them. confusion. Yeah. Were you also confusion. hurt in the church as well? Yeah, just probably from bullies and stuff like that in church when I was younger. And what got me was seeing adults being hypocrites because we kids could know what other kids know. You kid them and you know they're, hey, look what my dad has. Look at these pictures in this book. What? He's a deacon. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of thing that was going on. Right. And so that okay. kind of turned So you off. noticed that even at an early age, and I guess in your 20s, early 20s especially, is when this experience happened where you died and you went to hell. So take us back to that moment where you got really sick. Or you, you were in your home when this happened, right? Yes. It was just you and your dog, I think, mm -hmm. at, the, at the time. Tell us what happened. Just to kind of make a real long story short is... Uh, I lived in a duplex apartment, rented it out with a couple of guys that came from me, with me from back east. And so it was near July 4th, and so they were going to go up to the Grand Canyon. We made these arrangements. So before, just the week before, prior to that, um, I'm working as a construction. I was an electrician, and I accidentally drank some water at a construction site that was in a cooler that was brought back from Nogales, New Me uh, Nogales Mexico, from a creek. And um, so it was very hot, and so I was thirsty. As I took the cooler out of there and drank it and handed it to a guy, he, he, didn't, he sped it out and he opened it up. I mean, it was mm. mold. There was mm. algae in it and little uh. wormy things floating oh. around. But you had already drank it by the time you oh, saw yeah. that. Oh, oh my so goodness. So I decided to take the, you know, the medical cure of any atheist would know, John Wayne cure of Jack Daniels, Jose Cuervo, and every other liquor I could get, but it didn't work. So you got really sick, and you were actually diagnosed with what? What was it called? Cholera, but who knows what else I contracted with Yeah. Wow. Okay, so did it happen right away that you got sick and had to go to so bed? You, you can check this out in your textbooks, and I got it within 12, maybe 13 hours. It started to hit me. I was in mm -hmm. work in the morning, and it started hitting me. I had to go home, and, and then it got worse really quick. And, you, and it, the pain is incredible. You go through. I wanted to say before we continue with that, there were people that witnessed to you, and there was a girl named Trish, and that's not her real name, it's the name you use in the book, that witnessed to you, and she made an impression on you because she was authentic in her walk with the Lord, and you were very impressed by that. Even though you hadn't made the decision to receive Christ, um, you, you admired her, and there were seeds that were planted in your heart with her. Is that true? Yes. When we met her, she was from Campus Crusade of, of, for Christ. We'd come up in the summer where I was and witnessed to all the, us teenagers up there. We kind of make fun of her sometimes, but she was always there and making a strong stand for Christ. And um, we kind of, she earned our respect. And so one day she was being accosted by two guys going in the back of this, the um, you know, storefront. So my friend and I jumped out of the, stopped our car and jumped out and took care of the two guys and told her to run. Mm. And after that, she just witnessed to us all the time. Mm. And she, um, uh, I could never trap her. I could, like any other Christian, I can make mincemeat out of. <laughs> but this, she, she come back at me. I tried to write that as best I could in the book. Well, and she would come back with, with intellect, but love. Yes. Is what I noticed. And it would, it would every time throw you, that's when you got the Holy Spirit. That's yes. right. Helping you yes. in these discussions. So that's really neat. Of course, you said that she died tragically uh, in a car accident yeah. by a drunk driver. Yeah, actually all the guys were just considering going to the campus crusade house that night and we were all stopped and we were drinking beer <laughs> trying to go there so we were all whatever and so we come down to the house and found out that she died in a car wreck. Oh. I thought that she would be there. Yeah, and you know, the reason that I mentioned Trish is that because she planted seeds into your heart that would eventually come to fruition. And so many times we think, oh, well, you know, it's not happening. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know if the Lord's using me or not. When in reality, you know, she went on to be with the Lord, but everyone that Brian has won to the Lord, I believe she has a part in that. Okay, so here you are. You're sick. Do you realize that you are about to die? Do you have any idea how sick you are? I knew I was sick because my uh, the roommates were telling me, you need to go to the hospital, dummy. I said, no, I, I wouldn't do it. I thought, you know, that I would recover. I'll fight this off, but no. I, was, I knew I was very sick. I didn't know how sick. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. You know, because with a high fever, you're not thinking correctly at all. Yeah, right. So they left, and you're there in the bed. What moment did you realize that you were dead? Um, well, what happened was, is uh, with cholera, you before your body goes into shock and you do die, you actually stand up and you walk around and you feel great. I didn't know this at the time. Mm. So as soon as they left, I collapsed on the floor and managed to get back to, into the bed. And that's when I died, mm. and because that's when it hit me. That's when I knew I was actually in trouble. Okay, so um, you talked about this in the book that you, your spirit man, because we're eternal, mm -hmm. came out of your body, because these are just earth suits, like, mm -hmm. we're not taking these to heaven. We're going to have new glorified bodies, thank God. Right. But anyway, <laughs> so you saw yourself laying there. What are you thinking as you see your body laying there? Well, it took my last breath. It's, just, it's like you just leave your body. It's like your last breath. You never forget it. And I just floated above the ceiling and just up to the ceiling. And I just, um, wow, I'm still alive. I'm an atheist. All the stuff they talked about the afterlife is true. Hmm. Uh, you know, I'm basically living a lie, you know. Hmm. And so. So you immediately recognized uh -huh. yes. well, that I being an atheist was a lie. Yeah. And plus being nearsighted, being able to see across the room and hearing things I could never hear before. And it, I was more alive when I left my body than I am now. Mm. I can't explain that. But I want to say, as he shares his testimony, it's very unusual because I always say this, that in the Bible it talks about that we're not to judge anyone mm -hmm. because only God knows the heart. Mm -hmm. So true. And so God obviously saw something in your heart even at that point. Mm -hmm because he's not going to sentence you to hell, but he is going to give you an experience that will forever change your life. So here you are, you start going up, what, towards the light? Well, I went into a dark void, and then I was hearing the most profound, beautiful music I ever heard in my life. And it was explaining to me the mysteries of God's character and nature in ways that I can't really articulate. And it was- Through the music? And through the music wow. and through, yeah, the music and just, the, the singing, it was a different language, yet I could understand every single word. Mm -hmm. And you're not rejecting that as you're going, you're no. like, you totally 100% believe what you're hearing. Oh yeah, I was, I was I, 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 in my generation, I was grooving it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it was, and I felt great. I mean, I felt this love and compassion and, and I'm going toward this light and uh, I was being explained why all the whys of, that we have wow. are answered going through there, and I didn't realize I was heading toward a reckoning at all. I mean, I thought this was great. You actually saw people that thought they were mm -hmm. going to heaven that didn't know the Lord and thought everything was great, and then you would see the demonic morph in front of them and, and lie and deceive them, and they were actually going to hell. Yes, yes, I saw a lot of those in hell. At what point did that stop, and then you begin the journey or into hell, like, what happened next? What happened next was, um, the closer I got to the light, I saw this, it was like a big rock suspended in space, and there was a person standing on it, and the light was coming from the person. And he was so brilliant, I can't explain the brilliance of the light, it was just profound. In fact, our human eyes can't see these colors, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and he was sitting on like a ledge on a wall, on this, uh, like a, like a I call it a seat. And he got off and he started walking down where I, where I was coming. And as soon as he got to the spot, I landed in front of him. I fell flat on my face. I mean, I, I was not flat. I mean, there was no way to stand before him. Every knee shall bow yeah. and every yeah. tongue confess that Jesus yeah. Christ is Lord. And I kind of kind of joke. I said someone had crazy glue on the back of their hand, took it on my shoulder and picked me up. And I really didn't want to stand in front of him. Mm -hmm. And I was just stood there. And then I realized, whoops, I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble because I was facing the reckoning because of what was exposed inside me was how I gained the system, you know. God is so good and so just. So I come back and I had a just big chip on my shoulder. And so I got this big thing because if why did all this happen to me? Why did all the why is all the evil in the world? If God was so good, couldn't you just get rid of it? No, there can be no God. That just led me in my ways that there would be no God whatsoever because he allows all this evil. And so I, that's how I thought. And just led me down this path where I just totally rejected God. But now here I was standing in front of him, and I'm standing in front of him, and he showed me his love, his compassion, his great grace, 
who he is. And then it's like, I took advantage of everything he gave me and I stuck my finger in his eye. That's why yeah. I can put it. You know, you wrote in the book, and I love this quote, because so many people have accused God of having criminal intent. Uh, you formerly spoke like one of the creatures you've seen indicting God and accusing him of creating sin. Listen again to you here. Just because something was found does not mean it was placed. Yes, God is the author of all things, as you argued years ago, but that does not mean he authored all effects. So, and what you were saying is that when people ask that question, you know, is God a good God? Well, he must have created sin, but, but he didn't. He gave us a free will and a free choice. And therefore, for him to be considered a just God, he had to allow us that decision to either accept or reject him. And in doing so, you know, sin came, we know sin came into the world. But again, just because um, God is the author of all things doesn't mean that he authored the effects. Mm -hmm. And that was man's choice. I think you used the example of if you have a rental home mm -hmm. and you bought it and you're the landlord and you give it and then the people don't take care of it. Who's to blame? Are you the one that caused evil or are the people the ones that caused mm -hmm. evil? So when you came to that realization, how did it change your thinking and how did it help you for the future? It helped me greatly in the future at the time. It was a big rebuke because I used to use that argument a lot. It was like, it was eating crow, basically. <laughs> it, it was like, whoops, mm -hmm. whoops, I'm the one that's wrong. And it was like God saying, I got gotcha. you. Right. Checkmate. God is, he has, he's absolute in his character and his nature. That's what I learned going, going there. Okay, so th I guess at some point that ended and you saw all of that. Did he say, I'm going to let you experience something that I want you to remember? I mean, did he, did he give you forewarning? What did he say? Well, when I remember standing before him, um, he just said that um, you're going to see, basically, you're going to see an awful place, say my name and my title, and your return is an option to be decided. And that was really yeah. hit me home. It's like, yeah. you know, this, this ain't over yet, buddy. I'll decide if you're coming back or not. Mm. And he had literally the keys of hell and death. And there are different type of keys. I, there are different like geometric shapes. And that's when he motioned with his hand with these keys, this door opened like a scroll. And I went into a tunnel-like vortex I wrote about in my book there. And there was like a um, some kind of entity that was leading you? Yeah, and that's when I got down into the place because I went through this tunnel and I f landed in this, I call it the land unknown that nobody talk, no, talks about because the Lord wanted me to, he actually told me I would speak about this at a later time. And so I came in this place and I saw all these relatives and people who died, I thought, you know, come up and greeting me. And they would turn into, later turn into these hideous creatures and they began to rush me. And so that's when I said, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, his name and his title. So look, his name yes. Yes. and his title, mm -hmm. yes. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and so that's all I said nonstop the whole time. I, I would there. be saying it the whole time. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, I said it like a machine gun. <laughs> did you walk through the tunnel or did you like fall? I fell and I actually hit the ground and bounced like that. Oh, wow. Boom, wow. Boom. Wow. So the first thing you saw were cubes, you said cubes, like prison cells. And even when they revived you in the hospital and you came back in your, into your body, you could not get those cubes out of your mind, could you? I no. mean, you, you kept saying, is this a cube? How do you know you weren't dreaming this? Oh, because you touch, taste, and feel, and smell it. The, the smell is so bad, it permeates. Mm. What was the first horrible thing that you saw? And, and the creature that was leading you was only given slight access to you, like you knew that that creature wanted to claw your eyeballs out, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. When I entered in, into the cell, it looked like the all outdoors. It came up to me and said it was going to show me around. And he stuck his hand in the horizon, ripped it like a scroll. And we stepped up and out of this place. So I followed. And he said, this was granite for you to see. And he hated my guts. He wanted to tear me to shreds. I wanted to wake up, but I could not mm. wake up at all. And a dream you can wake up, a nightmare you can wake up from, you will. 
and this you can't. Wow. And so I stepped up out of this place, a wide, dusty road, and I came out of a, a 10 by 10 cell, basically. Could have been a little bigger. The dimensions is hard because it's so hot and it's like heat waves. Mm. I looked inside me and, and all over there and over and there. I saw these cells and people were inside the cells. The cells were stacked on top of each other, six high. Each thing had a person inside. They were inhabited with a, some creatures. Some of them were chained to the cell to be mm. with them forever. Others could come and go yes. as they please. Wow. And that's what I was seeing. And, and there were different levels, like based on what they did on yeah. Earth, like to the degree of the evil. Yes. Or versus some that just rejected Christ. And so there, that was interesting to me that there were, there were different levels. But you said it's almost like as you walk past these different cubes that it, you had a knowledge of who and what they had been on earth. And it, it made you really sad to see them in there and how they were suffering. You knew everything about them, just looking at them and saw their life history, their traumas, and all the excuses they made, and here they were in hell reaping what they have sown, just like the Bible mm -hmm. says. So where does scripture line up with what, you're, with what you're sharing? Well, that can be found, it's found in basically in the book of Revelation, it's the bottomless pit, Ezekiel chapter 32, I believe it is, it talks about hell being roundabout with chambers of death or chambers or cells mm -hmm. embedded in its walls. Wow. So the best description I can give in a nutshell would be a spiral staircase. And the bricks in the wall would be the cells, the spire of the staircase would be the wide, dusty road, and you have an open area. And that's where these tornado vortexes were mm. uh, dropping people off. Some people were mm. being escorted in, the, wow. in this uh, dry, dusty road, being prodded into their place. Mm -hmm. Gaggles of these entities, these demonic creatures. Um, uh, it's really, really, really strange looking things. And, and these people would go into their cells. That's what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. It's so called I the bottomless went, pit. You went to like the second, third, fourth, fifth, the sixth level was really evil. And mm -hmm. you said there was there was a witch in one of the prison yeah. cells, like, and somehow you knew it was from the 1800s. What oh. what did you see in that in that mm -hmm. picture? Well, she was inside of a coffin, scratching to get out. But I could see her inside the coffin. But there were four walls to the coffin. But I could see inside of it at the same time, and she was looked like a fiend, and she's trying to scratch out. And this is what I try to tell people. This is the Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 17 through 23 type of occultist. This is the one that knows what they're doing. They cast spells. They kill people before their time, just like the scriptures say. Did you see anybody that you knew or that we would know? And I saw Adolf Hitler there. I'll be not the only one and another individual, so. Mm -hmm. So what was happening to Hitler? Uh, for Mr. Hitler, uh, I knew instantly his descendants. So every person that he's responsible for killing, he was going to have happen to him. So when I saw him, he was being burned alive in one of those ovens. Wow. So it's like hell is experiencing the worst torment of what you were on earth that was unrepented. Yes. The thing about the gospel is that he came for all of us, mm -hmm. and he never intended for any of us to go to this place we're talking about. And, you know, if we confess our sins, mm -hmm. he is faithful and just mm -hmm. yes. to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so I just want to say that today. I don't, you know, whatever you've done on earth, I want to tell you that God loves you yes. and he will forgive you. Yes. And um, there's so much more in the book you want to hear about. He tells a lot more stories of things he sees in there. And it took you a long time to write the book, you tell me. But... Um, Finally, at the ending part, when it was decided that you would come back to earth, and by the way, he became a Christian right when he came back. Yes. <laughs> but what, what happened there at the end? Because it was, it was, it was quite moving what happened to you. Yeah, um, this, this is the part that I went down to a lower level into hell, and I came to an area where the cell was open. And any, anything could come inside of it. And... While I was on there, this creature would say, you know, you know, curse God, curse me, you know, or I promise you, I offer you half my kingdom if you'll follow me. And what he meant was half the kingdom of hell would be in there to torment me. Mm. And so the cell was open. It looked like a green dentist chair, but that wasn't a dentist chair. That was one of these entities. And they're all in there. And I was totally abandoned. I had no, there's no love. There's no hope. Wow. There's no, the most awful feeling. There's no hope. This is it. This is what I deserve. So I was walking, uh, I was standing there 
did not want to go inside that place at all. And it's like something was pushing me. And I had this dry, dusty goo, and like there's little wormy things that come out with the worms have teeth in them, and these little white moths with teeth in them. And they'll be squeaking blasphemies. And I, it was, I did not want to go in that thing, and yet I knew it. And I couldn't tell my parents that, you know, Mom, you know, I'm not a good old boy. And the pastor would probably say, I know he's in heaven. I go, Mom, I'm not. I couldn't do anything. I was, it was the most hopeless you ever felt in your life. And I also felt a presence coming in behind me. And as the presence was coming, it was rocking the ground. And I noticed the entities were getting very agitated. Mm -hmm. And the closer he came, it was thundering and the ground was like shaking. And these things took off out of there and they scurried out and got out of there quick. And I thought, I don't know who this was. And um, when you're in a hopeless situation like this, um, Wow, and this always does this to me. <laughs> you um, uh, have no hope. This is where you belong. When he picked me up, and when he picked me up, he held me like a baby, and I could see his wrist, his bones were pulled apart with the holes in his wrist, and that just tore me up. Wow. Because he did that for us. <laughs> and we didn't deserve it. Yeah. I didn't deserve escaping that place. And I know it. Mm. And, um... And so I cried in his shoulder the whole time when we were leaving. And I felt love and compassion like I never felt before. And, and you knew this was Jesus, of mm-hmm. course, by oh, looking yeah. at the scars. Oh, yes. And so he carried me out of there. During the time he was coming and carrying me out, as I kind of saw through the hells, walls of hell, so to speak. And that's when I saw the lake of fire being prepared, being stoked up hotter and hotter. I knew that this place, and intuitively, though I did not know nothing about the Bible, was going to be tossed into it at a future point in time. Wow. It was all going to come like that. He, sh- he showed that to me. Mm. And uh, yeah, that, that's what and and I was you rescued. Were pretty much back in your body. Well, he went to the same place I came out of, and I came right back to the rock. And he, sp- he spoke to me, he blew on me, and I went, backwards and float it right back into my body. Wow. And of course, again, there's so much to the story and he gives so, so many more details, but of course he, he was in the hospital and first thing he finally realized, okay, I'm not in hell. And God transformed his life, set him free, saved him, filled him with the spirit. And um, now 30 years later, <laughs> he's shared his testimony all over Mm. the world. And now he's sharing it all over the world with those of you that are watching. Well, we are out of time. I know today's topic, it seems heavy, but it's so important to remember that God did not create hell for mankind. It's also not his will that any should go there. And so today, if you're watching, all you have to say is, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. Come into my heart right now. Forgive me of my Mm. sins. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for filling me with your spirit. And thank you for what you did at Calvary and for rising from the dead on the third day. Thank you for paying the price for my sins. And my grandpa, he just prayed a prayer. Lord, if you're there, I need you. That's what he prayed. And God knew his heart and changed his life. Well, we do have prayer partners that are standing by ready to pray with you. Make sure that you're ready to meet the Lord. I mean, you think, well, it's just that simple. He did the hard part. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is believe and confess and receive God's love in your life today. Of course, you can also go to daystar.com and click on prayer. If you have a special prayer request, you would love for us to pray with you about it. It's our honor to do so. We pray for all the prayer requests that come in from around the world. I want to thank Brian for sharing his powerful story with us. There's so much more, again, we could tell. So you'll definitely want to pick up a copy of his book, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion. It's available now. And for more on his ministry, you could visit him online at afterhoursministries.com. As always, be sure to share your thoughts about today's program by leaving us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. We always love hearing how Table Talk has touched your life. Thank you so much for watching. It's a new day. I'm so excited about those of you that prayed that prayer. Call and let us know. We'll send you a free book entitled 
Now what? Now what? <laughs> and uh, we have it in English and in Spanish. So a lot of times I say what now? Now what? <laughs> now what do I do? I and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Brian. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.